Okay. Well, everybody, welcome to our humble service, our humble congregation. Just uh, look forward to spending another Sabbath with you. So let's bow our heads and pray. Start off with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you uh, that you reached into our hearts and, and uh, made us able to fellowship with you again after having fallen. And we just uh, thank you that you brought us together with each other so that we can fellowship with each other and you at the same time. I'd just like to ask you to uh, send your Holy Spirit here among this fellowship while we worship and just uh, let us adore you, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Right. So, so the scripture today is from Philippians 4, starting at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are, are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you know we have a lot going on here. Besides our weekly gatherings for worship and for fellowship, and of course we acknowledge that's that's among the most important things we do. And we thank you for each other. We pray for each other. And Father, as, as we look ahead, knowing that we have events coming up, we pray for them. Father, we thank you for those in the Foothill Community Church and for those in the conference who support us and who encourage us and who are willing to take time and energy and travel to to be a part of things that that we're going to be doing here so we want to commit all this to you and ask your blessing father we we pray for safety for those who will be traveling sometime soon we want to commit each other to you ask you to guide us and so we thank you again for our church for each one who is here In jesus name amen great is his faithfulness indeed mind if i put this here that's my backup bible in case my new bible locks up or something so So, I wanted to talk today about, well, some of God's attributes that we uh, that we uh, enjoy, that He uh, blesses with, that we can participate in, that we can discern, and those things are things like uh, truth, goodness and beauty. I want to talk about what those things are and why they should matter to us. And uh, while I was preparing this sermon, I decided, you know what? I should mention love as well. But these are uh, basically what are called by philosophers and theologians the transcendentals, things that uh, are are what I've heard some people call the durables, the things that do not change. A lot of things in our life, a lot of things in the universe that are continually changing, but there are certain things that do not change. And in that sense, they reflect 
God's glory. This is like a, the last hymn we heard, that as you were, you always will be. God does not change, and we don't want him to. Anyway, uh, I, when I looked this up, I noticed that some people include with truth, goodness, and beauty. Um, also, oneness. And uh, that is one I, I think is true. It's true, but it's something we have to be careful with because a lot of people consider oneness to be... Uh, They, they they get carried away with it. They go from uh, we are all from one being. God created us all to we are all one being. Everything is one being. There are no distinctions, which of course that is making a distinction. But so it's illogical. But they. Uh, go from oneness to monism to even what uh, people call oneism or onism or onism. I've heard it pronounced all those ways. And that is the belief that everything is, is one. All distinctions are delusions. And, and, and from that, we, we, get people saying things like, well, the divine is in all of us. And in a sense, that's true. God is causally involved with us always. But that doesn't make us divine like him. It doesn't make him God. They say people think we are all part of the same Godhead. And as I was looking it up to see how they put it, all is one and one is all. Well, we are all from one, one being, but we are not that being. And we got, we got to be careful to avoid that, that, uh, that blasphemy, basically. Go ahead and turn, uh, you can turn in your Bibles to Philippians 4. Eight and nine. Uh, well, that's we just read that. I thought I'd read it again, just to, just to re-emphasize the fact that uh, these things are things that we are supposed to be considering, that we are supposed to look into. When it is written, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. Dwell on those things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and God and the God of peace will be with you. We, so we are commanded to believe what is true. We are you know, commanded to discern it, and we are commanded to accept it. Go to Romans one eighteen. And here we see that uh, refusing to, certainly, and but even failing to uh, commit ourselves to the truth has consequences. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident within them. So, we, one thing that we do know about God, we hear it all the time, God is truth. We hear also that God is good. And, and, and on and on with his attributes. But that doesn't mean he's just truth. I mean, but he is truth. He is a source of truth. It all emanates from him and goodness. Okay, but what is truth? Well, what I've been taught 
in my studies and my uh, involvement with uh, theologians and apologists is, well, the definition of truth is a one-to-one -one correspondence between what is believed or asserted and what in reality is. So, if nothing else, we can say that if God is truth, he certainly is. But <sighs> turn to uh, Psalm 19. So when I say that, you don't have to turn to it. I'll read it. But, I mean, if you... <laughs> Psalm 19... Verses 1 and 2. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. So we can know truth. It is obvious to us. That's how we discern truth. Also, you know, that's, that's, the, that's what theologians call general revelation. God reveals the truth to us through what he has created. Everything that he has created. Us, the universe, everything. Things that are both physical and non-physical. But there's also special revelation. Look at uh, John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus, you know, we've seen where he, he doesn't explicitly all, uh, say he's God. Uh, at least that's the challenge I've seen. But he accepts worship from his apostles and others as God. He makes it clear that he is God. And he's saying to us that he is the truth. And uh, it comes down to us through the Bible. Basically, God's special revelation, the revelation he has, has given to us through prophets, through people who have recorded what God has revealed to them so that we can have it as well. So look there, of course. That's where we look. And I think in our uh, statement of beliefs, it says the Bible is the final you know, source of our faith and practice. And it should be. It should be. Okay. So... Let's look and see what the Bible says is true. Look at Luke 1. That's a good one. I, I like to start with uh, when people challenge me that the Bible's not history. It's not actually a record of things that are true, that things that have happened so that we can know that God does rule. People like to say, well, that was just a history as it was practiced back in the ancient times. It was more narrative than facts. It didn't really even worry about things like phonological order and uh, all that. But if you look at the beginning of the book of Luke, he starts out. In as, in, in as much as many have undertaken, compile an account of the things accomplished among us. So he's compiling an account of something that happened. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He going to eyewitnesses. This is, these are the practices of modern historians. It seemed fitting for me as well, 
having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order. Just like modern historians. In consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that have been taught. So we look for truth basically through the same methods that everyone else looks for it. And then go to Acts 26. Verses 24 through 26. Now here, if you, if you started at the beginning of this chapter, you would see Paul is on trial again. He's uh, basically been brought up in charges before, uh, I think it was Agrippa, of course, by the Jews in, in the region. And uh, he has to give an accounting for himself. So he says, I am not out of my mind, because they were accusing him of being out of his mind. Oops, I forgot to, verse 24. While Paul was saying all the things that had happened to him and he had done and seen, uh, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. By utter words of sober truth, for the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. That's an important issue. If you look at certain other faiths, like uh, Mormonism or Islam, their holy books were written kind of in secret. Muhammad, I think, went to a mountain and was claimed an angel came to him and dictated certain parts of the Quran. Joseph Smith got a hold of some, I think they were Egyptian hieroglyphic, hieroglyphics, which no one could read at the time anyway. And then he went behind a curtain with a, a stone and, and and, and uh, basically dictated through the curtain to someone to write things down. They were done in secret. But when we want to know the truth, we want to know what Christ has done for us, what God has done, what God is. It's all laid out for us out in the open. How many thousands of people knew Christ and saw him perform miracles, saw him die, and knew he was dead? and then saw him alive again. That's how we can be confident in the truth and that we can have faith, faith. Another thing, another term I think uh, I should define, faith as I've been taught is commitment based on Belief based on evidence. Our faith goes back to the evidence of the truth, of reality, what is. So, what does God's word tell us about the other transcendence? the durables, the things that do not change and therefore reflect God's nature. How about goodness? What I have been taught that good is, according to the Bible, which really is probably the source of that word in our language since the Bible was written and came down to us before our language fully developed. So I go with the Bible and see what the 
the original meanings of certain words or people twist words around now and use them improperly. But what I've been taught that the Bible says good is good equal what ought to be. It's that simple. Look at Psalm 100, verse 5. And guess what? It refers back to our source of the durables, the transcendentals, as they are called by some. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is as he ought to be. In fact, he is a source of good. Good emanates from him. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. Well, I guess we could add to that Romans 12. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if good is what ought to be, what is evil? Evil is, as I've been taught, <laughs> nothing more than the privation of good. It's where good is missing. It's something other than what ought to be. It's not something in and of itself, really. It's kind of like this. Paper is missing right here. This page was made for a certain purpose to be used in a certain way, and now I've ruined it. <laughs> but you notice that this hole in the paper, a hole isn't something in and of itself. It's just something that's missed. It's someplace where something is missing. It's not like uh, when I was a lot younger, I went and saw an animated feature called The Yellow Submarine. Uh, it was a Beatles thing. And there was one scene where they went to a place and it was the sea of holes. There was just nothing but holes everywhere. And they would pop in and out of them, you know, surprise each other. And when they were getting ready to leave the place, Ringo Starr grabbed one of the holes and picked it up and folded it up and put it in his pocket. And then he proclaimed, oh, I have a hole in me pocket. <laughs> but you can't do that with a hole. He used it later in the movie to save the day, unfolded it and threw it out. And But that's not how... That's not how it works. And that's not how evil works. Evil is not something in and of itself. It's just something where good is missing. That doesn't mean you can't do something that is evil. You could be doing things that are evil, but they're evil because you're doing something other than what you ought to be doing. And it has consequences. <laughs> Look at uh, Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, which is happens a lot these days, doesn't it? Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
And you could go on to 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. They don't look to the source of truth and good and beauty. They make it up. And you just see artists these days. Anymore, it's, it's got to be hard to be an artist who doesn't just want to go around offending people by doing things that are just wrong. Because that's what they say art is these days. And it's not. It's not. Okay, well, we know how not to be good. But how do we, how can we be good? Is it possible? I mean, I look in the mirror a lot of times and I don't think there's such a perfect guy looking back at me. But look at Psalm, verse, or Psalm 37. Verses three through six. Trust in the Lord and do good. Back to the source. Good emanates from God. He does what ought to be. He has done what ought to be. And he doesn't change. We change. Do you remember in the beginning of the Bible where God was hovering over the what he had created so far and he said it is good it is ought to be oops it is ought it was as he intended and he intends he's not capable of intending anything that is wrong i mean he might be all powerful but he can't violate his own nature he can't be not god he's god trust in the lord and do good dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit yourself to the way of the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgments as noonday. That's how we do what is good. And I know we won't ever always do it, and we can never of our own power perfect ourselves and, and so that we always do nothing but good even if we did we wouldn't be perfected because we've already done things that were not right and those are the things we had to be forgiven for someone had to pay the price for that which brings us to the role model of our good in luke 18 verse 19. Let's look at uh, verse 18 too. A ruler was questioning Jesus saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He called him good teacher. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. He's our role model. Because Jesus, he's the son of God, yes, but he's also the son of man. He's one of us. He is our kinsman, redeemer. So he, he can show us what we ought to do that we don't do. But he also can pay the penalty for what we when we fail. We're almost done. Maybe. I knew this sermon would either go too way too short or way too long, but so we need to conform to Christ's example as much as we possibly can. And if we do that, and we, and, or at least if we look to him for what is true and what is good, we will see what is beautiful. Because beauty, as I've been taught, is what epitomizes what is true and what is good. So does that make physical beauty good? in and of itself, 
it's it's not a bad thing it's it's a uh, physical beauty tends to be you know when we see someone who looks beautiful they they look like they're good in the sense that they're healthy they don't have any obvious ailments that would be not good and it gets our attention by the way so anyone who is unusually attractive they should keep in mind that studies have shown that unusually attractive people whether male or female are the people that uh, the rest of us tend to pay attention to more than we do others so that's a chance if you you could uh, show people what true beauty is look in proverbs 31 30 though Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. So that makes it sound like beauty is not so good. But, this is talking about a woman in this case. It's talking about the kind of woman make a good wife. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So, true beauty really depends on something that is not physical. Look in Isaiah 52.7. And this is a song, a hymn that we, we used to sing a lot uh, at the uh, first uh, Seventh-day Baptist church I attended, the church I attended when I first got saved. Isaiah 52, 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. So it says how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him. You know, usually we don't think of feet as being, you know, the place you look for something beautiful, especially in those days. They wore sandals and they got around mostly by walking. And they transported things usually by pack animals, and and uh, they had just stock animals all over everywhere. And now I, I grew up around stock animals, horses and cows and such. Have any of you done that? You noticed what's all over the ground all the time. You know, in a world like that. So if you have donkeys and oxen and everything continually going around the streets, and you're trotting around there in your sandal feet. You know, it's it's not like, you know, usually the someone came to visit a household, and Jesus did this once, and they had someone, and in this case, who was truly lucky, got to take off his sandals and wash his feet. But usually, people would not think themselves lucky to do that. They would think, oh, wow. But... There's something beautiful about the feet of this person. They're bringing good news of happiness. They're announcing salvation and announcing that God reigns. Salvation and God's will prevailing. Salvation is the good that God willed for us. That he has always willed for us. Look in First Peter, or I'm sorry, Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He wants us all to be saved. Because he loves us. 
That's why. And the definition of love, as I understand it, and when I look in the Bible, it seems to play out. Love is to will good, what ought to be for someone. And God wills that for us. But we still have free will. Okay, so I'll stop real quick and define freedom. Freedom is the power to do what one ought to do. Before Christ saved us, made us free again, we did not have that power. We could do good things, but only because we felt like it, not because it was good. But he gives us back the power to do good because we ought to. So look in Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us, paid the penalty of our sin so that we could be free again, so that we could be good again. That's how God loves us. Okay, but if love is to will good for someone, how do we love God? He's already good. He's the source of good. I think it's by submitting to his will. What did Jesus say to Philip in verse in John 14, 15? If you ask me anything in my name, I whoops, that can't be right. Oh, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's how we love God. We submit to his will by loving one another as well. And uh, for our final verse today, look in 1 John 4, starting at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God which manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, to be the propitiation for our sins, the remedy for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So we can't see God physically. But if we love one another, God abides in us. That's how we see him. His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he is in God. For he abides in God. We have come to know and have believed the love for which God has for us. God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected in us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. That's awesome. There is no fear of love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he loved us first. 
If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen and not love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. And by the way, I do love all of you. I do will good for all of you. And I think I've talked before about how, about how much I look forward to that great day when we will be caught up again and perfected and brought into the presence of God always and forever and with each other as well. We'll spend the rest of eternity with each other. And maybe I shouldn't go off on one of my weird philosophical tangents about how in paradise, love won't be linear like it is in this life. It won't be just something we can, it won't be like we can only focus on one thing, truly focus on one thing at one time. It's not even it's not just one dimensional time. I think time will be not even just two dimensional. I think it'll be three dimensional. We will be able to participate in an infinite number of timelines simultaneously. We will simultaneously be in God's presence, adoring him and just being loved by him and blessed by him continuously. And we will continuously, I think, be able to be in each other's presence continuously all the time and enjoy, enjoying each other's love and maybe reminisc reminiscing a life in this world when we struggled to do what God would have us do, to commit to truth, to do what is good, what we ought to do. and to recognize and value beauty, true beauty, and to love one another and love God. Anyway, let's pray. Our Lord, our Father in heaven, we come before you each week to revel in your love, to adore you, to enjoy your beauty, to do as much as we are humanly capable of doing what is good in your sight and to understand what is true about you and us and the world that you have created. We ask you to come among us now and send us out, out into the world and be a witness to your love, your beauty your goodness, and your truth. In your name, Jesus. Amen.